When was the last time that you were afraid? And what was it that helped you press through that fear? As many of you know, Leif and I have a son, and he actually turned three on Tuesday this week. He's been going through a season of being scared to be alone in his room at night. So... Leaf and I are quite tired in this season from waking up in the middle of the night to comfort our scared little guy. And we've tried various tactics to help him uh, get through the night. We, he has a night light. We talk to him through the monitor, tell him we're still here, say Jesus is with you, mommy and daddy are right outside your door. What we're learning works the best, though, for this three-year-old to push through his fear at night is to tell him stories about characters, animals, sometimes transformers, who have funny names and who are scared to be alone at night, but they, they figure out how to be brave and be alone. <laughs> We're finding it helps him when he's afraid. And I think that makes sense because he needs a model of someone. He needs to know that someone else has been there before, that someone else too has been afraid of being alone at night and they have learned how to be brave so he can too. When was the last time you were afraid? What helped you push through that fear? This morning we find ourselves in the third part of our series, Living by Faith, in which we are going through Hebrews chapters 11 through 13. And we're asking, what does biblical faith consist of? In week one, Pastor Tim taught us that sometimes in this world, we're told that faith is about taking risk, doing things like climbing a mountain without a rope, or riding a motorcycle. But the book of Hebrews really shows us that biblical faith is different than risk assessment. Biblical faith, although sometimes requiring an element of risk, is about more. It's about holding on to the promises that God gives us through Jesus, understanding them, trusting in them, because our faith is only as strong as what we have faith in, the God who gives these promises. In part two, Pastor Tim taught that faith is really about a lifelong pilgrimage. This is something we do over the span of our lives. And we looked at the, five, at the lives of five pilgrims, Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, and Sarah, and learned from them that the journey of faith doesn't always look perfect, and there are ups and downs, but this is a lifelong thing, and they are good models for us. Today, we are asking about how faith helps us press through our fear. In other words, we are asking when we are afraid, how does faith help us press through that? Our passage today is from Hebrews 11, verses 23 through 38. It's kind of a long one. But if you are able, would you stand for the reading of the word this morning? Hear the word of the Lord from Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, Moses' Moses's parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw that he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as a greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who was invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and the application of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land. 
But when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the army had marched around them for seven days. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, gained what was promised, who shut the mouth of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. And there were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better understand, a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So what's going on in this passage? In these 15 verses, the author of the book of Hebrews is giving examples of people in Jewish history who were, who were great pillars of faith through times of fear. The author first references two really well-known stories, the story of Moses, who grew up to save the people of Israel, of Israel out of Egypt, and the story of Rahab, who helped the Israelite spies so that the walls of Jericho could come tumbling down. These two stories are ones in which these characters could have been paralyzed by fear, but they pressed through in faith. The author then briefly references six biblical heroes, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, and David, and Samuel, whose faith helped them persevere through various fearful situations. And then as a group, the author references the old Hebrew prophets by various situations, and some who are familiar with the biblical passages might be able to guess who they're referencing. Uh, shutting the mouth of lions seems to be about Daniel. Quenching the fire seems to be about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Women who receive back their dead, that seems to talk about the miracles of Elijah and Elisha, and so on. So while many of these stories are familiar, the author then ends this section with stories that are perhaps unfamiliar to us, talking about the martyrs. And while we may be tempted to assume this is talking about New Testament Christian martyrs, we have to remember the context of Hebrews 11 is Jewish history, not New Testament Christianity. So it begins with this statement, chapter 11 begins, now faith is confidence in what we hope for, assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. And then the author goes on to talk about the ancients. So these are stories of old. Biblical scholars like N.T. Wright and Craig Keener point out that some of these stories can be traced back to the martyrs' stories in the apocryphal books of 1st and 2nd Maccabees. Those are books that are not in our, our Protestant Bible, but are scriptures for our Catholic brothers and sisters. And they tell the political, military, and diplomatic events of the Jewish people during the second century BC. So while we may not be familiar with these stories, those many Christians at the time of the book of Hebrews would have been, because they would have come from Jewish families. They would have known these stories well. So the author of Hebrews in this passage is giving us examples of people in scripture and Jewish history who faced situations where they should have been very afraid, and perhaps they were, but their faith helped them press through their fear. So that's what's being stated here, but what is the author doing by doing this? I was pondering this very question one of the nights this last week, and I was putting Jonathan to bed, our son, and, um, he was really scared to be left alone, so I started telling him a story I made up about Quackers the duck and how he learned to be in his nest alone, even though mommy and daddy duck were on the other side of the grass. Um, 
And it hit me somewhere in the middle of telling him the story that that is what the author of Hebrews is doing here. That, that the author of Hebrews is telling stories to Jesus followers about people of faith who have faced fearful situations and have pressed through in faith so that they too can be brave when they face situations where they are filled with fear. Like me telling my son stories about animals who are brave to help him press through his fear of being alone at night, the author of Hebrews is telling stories about heroes of faith who are brave to help Jesus followers press through and be brave. And to make it all the more powerful while my stories are made up, the stories that the author of Hebrews is telling are true. Real people and real fear and real faith. When was the last time you were afraid? What helped you press through your fear? For my son, his answer would be having a model of bravery that shows him that he can do it too. And I think that the New Testament Christians might have a similar answer. What helps them press through their fear? Having these models of faith from scripture, from Jewish history, to emulate so they can press through their own fears. And while there are too many examples in this one passage to go into in one sermon, I do wanna focus on two categories of models of faith that seem to stick out. On one side, you have Rahab and Moses. And on the other, you have the stories of the martyrs. Rahab and Moses seem to represent a category of people whose faith helped them press through their fear and they saw earthly victory. But the martyrs, they seem to represent a group of people who, whose faith helped them press through fear and didn't see earthly victory, but eternal victory. Two different models of faith, two different situations of fear turned out two very different ways. So let's look at Moses and Rahab. If you're unfamiliar with the story of Moses, his, much of his story can be found in the book of Exodus, beginning right at the first chapter. But he was born a Jewish slave in a time in Egypt when the Pharaoh had ordered that all Jewish boys be killed. But his mother saved him, putting him in a basket and sending him down a river. And he was found by Pharaoh's daughter and raised as a part of Pharaoh's household. And later in his life, God called him to set the Jewish people free from slavery in Egypt. And after all the plagues and the successful march through the Red Sea, they were indeed freed. But Moses wasn't the leader who ended up taking the people of Israel into the land God had promised. That ended up being Joshua. And the first land that Joshua was called to conquer was a place called Jericho, where Rahab lived. Rahab was not a Jew. And if you're unfamiliar with her story, you can find it in Joshua 2 and 6. But she was, a, she was a citizen of Jericho. So when Joshua sent spies to, to see how to take down this city, she helped them. And she hid them and she helped them escape. And she told them that in fact, God was gonna give the city over to them, which is something they seemed not to really be sure of at the point. But that really helped spur on Joshua to go into the city. So taking a look at these stories of Moses and Rahab, we actually see they have a lot in common. A Jewish scholar, Tikva Freimeyer Kinski, points out that throughout, Jesus, throughout Moses' life, women saved him. From his mother and the midwives who disobeyed Pharaoh, to his sister who looked after him and then helped him lead, to Pharaoh's daughter who cared for him, to his wife Zipporah who appeased God's anger. Similarly, Rahab functions for Israel in a similar manner of saving. She acts for the spies as the midwives did for Moses when she defies the king's order and saves them. Rahab even hides the spies from the king's men underneath uh, stalks of reeds, just as Moses' mother hides him from the Pharaoh in a basket made of reeds. Both Moses and Rahab faced the threat of powerful earthly kings. Both Moses and Rahab faced a crisis of identity. To which kingdom did they want to belong? Both Moses and Rahab had to trust that God would move 
big metaphorical mountains to achieve God's ends. And both of them, when faced with these situations that could have paralyzed them in fear, pressed through in faith, believing in the promises God had given them. The promise Moses held on to was that God would indeed free the people of Israel. And the promise that Rahab held on to was that God would be victorious in giving Jericho over to the people of Israel. And both of them are models for us of people who faced situations that would fill us with fear, seemingly unsurmountable realities, but who, even though they may have been afraid, pressed through because they had faith in God. They are models for us that we can cling to and look to and hold on to in times when we are afraid as well and gain inspiration, just like my three-year-old son holds on to the stories that I tell him at night. But these aren't the only models that the author of Hebrews gives. Hebrews 11 tells the stories of the martyrs as well. Because not every situation that we face is going to end in earthly victory. And this is a reality that the, the Christians at the time of the book of Hebrews knew really well. If we look at the chapter before Hebrews 11 and chapter 10, we read that they've already actually faced some persecution. They've endured great conflict and suffering They've been publicly insulted and persecuted. They chose to stand with those who were mistreated and so they were imprisoned and having their property confiscated. And in the following chapter, Hebrews 12, we see that the author hints at the fact that they're probably gonna go through even more than this. And on this side of history, we know that that was indeed true for them. And so alongside the stories of Moses and Rahab, who experience earthly victory, we have the stories of the martyrs, who don't. People who died horrible deaths on the account of their faith in Yahweh. So then what was it that helped, what was it that the martyrs had faith in that helped them press through their fear? The text tells us that they hoped they might gain an even better resurrection. It also says that the world was not worthy of them. You see, nearly all Jewish people in the time of the New Testament would have known these stories of these martyrs. And nearly all Jewish authorities at that time would have taught that the martyrs receive a special treatment at the resurrection. I think there's a good amount in scripture to say that that's true. And as we look at things like Romans chapter eight, it talks about those who've been baptized into the family of God are now co-heirs and siblings with Jesus. We share in his suffering, but also in his glory. For Jesus too suffered a horrible death, but then was also raised in glory. Romans 8, 18 says, I consider that our present sufferings are not even worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. What is the hope the martyrs grasped? It was the promise of God that there is more than this. That as wonderful and, and beautiful as this world can be, there is something even greater still yet to come when God's kingdom is fully realized. So that even if we lose all that we have, if we suffer the losses of our health and property and loved ones and our lives, that there is still more and still better yet to come. That the things of this world are not what we put our hope and our trust in. And that the kingdom is so much greater than this, so much so that our present sufferings aren't even worth comparing to that glory. That is what the martyrs held on to. And that's what we can hold on to as well. Because while sometimes our faith does help us press through fear and we see victory in our situation, sometimes our faith can help us press through fear and we don't see that victory on this side of eternity. When was the last time you were afraid? What helped you press through your fear? As I thought about that question this week, <laughs> my answer would be, the last time I was afraid was last Sunday. <laughs> As many of you know, I've been struggling with kidney stones during this pregnancy, and last Sunday they got very difficult to deal with. 
Um, the pain got so bad that Leif ended up having to take me to the hospital. And as we were waiting to get admitted, the, everything, the pain started contractions, and I just started getting really afraid. I was afraid that the contractions would start labor, that the baby was gonna come too early. I know I'm rather big, but it's still too early. <laughs> I was afraid that the doctors wouldn't be able to stop labor. And in that space, this sermon was going through my mind because this is what I've been working on. <laughs> and one story really stuck out to me from this vast list that the author of Hebrews gives us. And it wasn't the story of Moses or Rahab, and it wasn't the story of the martyrs. It was a really vague reference in the middle to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And I won't go into their story too much, but, but the part of their story that stuck in my head was we believe God will deliver us from this. But even if God doesn't, we will not worship other gods. And I thought, that faith speaks to me here because I don't know what's going to happen. That's faith in the midst of the unknown. Because the reality is God did not promise that I'm going to carry this baby to term. The reality is God did not promise that I would not have pain or that parenting will be easy. Those aren't promises that I can have my faith in because that's not what God has said. But I can have faith in the goodness of God. I can have faith in the promise that nothing will separate me from the love of God. I can have faith that God's love can cast out fear and that no matter what happens, God is with me. Like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I can say, I will pray for God to deliver me from this, but even if God doesn't, I will not give myself over to fear. I will lean on the promises of God, the pillars of faith who've gone before me. I'll lean on Leif, my husband. I'll lean on all of you who in my community who are praying for me and the examples of parents who've gone before me, and this will help light my way forward. And don't get me wrong, I was very afraid. <laughs> I think being people of faith doesn't mean we don't experience fear. It just means that we know we have help and we don't have to get overcome by it. When was the last time you were afraid? What helped you press through your fear? Many often point out that do not fear or fear not is stated almost 365 times. Some people say 366 times in scripture. But I like to point out that scripture doesn't just give this like as a command, but really as an encouragement. Because scripture gives us all these examples of people of faith who kind of like signs on the road that tell us which way to go. They, they serve as these pillars of faith that show us how to, how to walk this trail, how to walk this journey of faith. Models like Moses and Rahab, whose faith helped them press through and see earthly victory. Models like the Jewish martyrs, whose faith helped them press through for eternal victory. And models like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whose faith helped them press through fear in the midst of the unknown. And like my son clinging to the models of Quackers the Duck to get him through his fear of being alone at night, we too can cling to these biblical models of faith and help us press through our own fears and whatever it is that we face. These models of faith bring us encouragement and hope so that we too can be like them. We too can press through our fear so that the next time we are afraid, we can look to them, trust in the promises of God, and press through. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Gracious God, we are so thankful that you are always with us. We are so thankful that your promise to us is that you will never leave us or forsake us. We're so thankful that your love is ever present and that nothing can separate us from that. God, thank you for the models of faith that have gone before us that we can look to in the times we are filled with anxiety and fear. Help us to know your promises well so that we can have faith in what you have said will come to pass. 
Help us to look to those models so that we too can press through. We love you, and it is in the name of your son, Jesus, that we pray. Amen.